Welcome to the GridMod Pod, brought to you by AEIC. In this podcast, you'll hear from the utility industry's top operations leaders on how their companies are working to modernize and improve our ever-evolving power grid. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, Katie. I'm so excited to have you today. As I was kind of quickly sharing before we started recording, you know, I think the perspective of the customer and everything that's happening in the grid mod space dynamically is very focused on the customer, but sometimes us operational folk may lose uh, sight of that. So I just want to take a moment for you to introduce yourself to our listeners, and then we can jump in and talk about all things grid mod relative to the customer. Great. Well, it's great to be here, Elizabeth. Super excited to have this conversation. Um, my name is Katie Sloan. For folks that aren't as familiar with Southern California Edison, we serve about 15 million customers over a 50,000 square mile service area in Southern California, as you might expect from the name. So we have people on the beaches and the mountains and the deserts, agriculture, urban areas. So just a really diverse set of customers, diverse set of living situations and business situations, um, and really on the forefront of the clean energy future. So my current role, <clears throat> I have all of the programs that really are helping to decarbonize from energy efficiency to building and transportation electrification, as well as customer solar and storage. And additionally, programs that help with reliability, like demand response, virtual power plants, uh, and also helping out our uh, underserved communities and customer experience. So I like to say all the fun stuff on the customer side, and we're really integrating more and more with our grid folk. Um, so really excited for this conversation. Yes. And I think, you know, for those of that are new to our podcast today, it's a great episode to jump in. I can already tell, but those that continue to listen, the grid modernization space is uh, is evolving. And uh, one reminder is, you know, we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, where what is happening to our society, let alone electric utility, is rapidly changing. And it's changing from the availability of technologies at scale that provide an enormous amount of data that allows us to then use that data to make decisions. Very high level. But so here we are as the entity or the industry that serves the lifeline of society, which is providing electrical power to each individual as we do it safely, reliably, and affordably. It's a continuous challenge. And so in the grid mod space, we like to kind of break down some of these big, large topics and really share the great work that's happening within the utility space. Um, the utilities are within a model that is highly regulated and there's a financial tie to it, which makes it a whole lot more complex. But at the root of it is how do we continue to serve the customer in all of these various aspects? So I'm just going to throw one over to you, Katie, you know, in the context of Gridmont, what role do you believe in what you're seeing in your uh, role <clears throat> over there at Southern Cal does consumer empowerment play? wholeheartedly uh, and driving these sustainable energy practices. Thanks for that question. I'll start with just kind of a high level, take a step back, where are we going and what is it going to take to get there? Because I think that really ties into how do our customers play a role in this? So we've put out a few different white papers, thought leadership papers around how do we meet California's 2045 uh, net carbon reduction goals, you know, zero, zero net carbon. And for us to get there, our latest paper that we put out the pathway for getting to 2045, we need to have hundred percent of retail sales decarbonized, which means 90% of all vehicles would need to be electrified. That includes passenger vehicles and also like buses, semis, trucks. We need 95% of buildings to be electrified. We also would need to use 48% low carbon fuels. And we would also then have to sink a significant amount of carbon. Um, so this is a huge transformation. What that means for the grid is that we expect that we're going to have to be building out our transmission system four times faster than we have previously and our distribution system 10 times faster than we had before. <laughs> So this is a huge amount of growth and it's a huge amount of build. And what we're really coming to terms with is that we can't do it like we did before. And we don't know that we would have the people, the resources, 
the financial capability to do all of that exactly as we do it today. So what that means is that we really want to leverage all of the great technologies that our customers are putting in, in order to lower that amount of build that we have to do, because we aren't going to be able to do it fast enough unless we do that. Um, so that means helping our customers to put in solar and storage at their homes that they can help provide you know, energy back to the grid at times when we need it. It needs additional options in demand response and demand flexibility. Um, it means options around virtual power plants. Vehicle to grid, that's another huge opportunity. We're having millions of cars that are electrified um, and the technology is coming in the vehicles. How do you then use that power to reduce the amount of distribution that you're building out? So I think we're really at the forefront here. Um, we're working through all of these things, but I think the good thing is that in California, our customers have already really adopted a lot of these technologies. 25% of all new car sales are electric vehicles. Uh, we see solar and storage are really doing well. We're getting about 4,000, 5,000 new installations every single month. And that, you know, is building off of already having thousands and thousands of customers with solar and storage. Um, so that technology is out there. It's like, how do we then use it? Everything you said is music to my ears. <laughs> so my origination of really getting excited and realizing the potential for this transformational change started really in 2017, where I took on the role of distribution planning. And I got to be invited and be a part of the AIC DER subcommittee. And I'll just say Southern Cal Edison was a large presence uh, where we had a great opportunity on the East Coast, us members, to really listen in and hear about the feasibility and that the technology is available to deploy, embrace, and then utilize that information to really drive decision-making power. And quite frankly, you know, you all kind of were trailblazing in all of the aspects of embracing these new technologies to shift and really empower the consumer, right? So the availability of solar panels was our first story. And as you have identified, uh, it has quickly rolled out into five various aspects. Not only can customers roll out solar, there's now becoming more accessible battery energy storage. Now you have the really intelligent smart meters or smart thermostats or smart water heaters, where you as a consumer can play a part in how you shift and really change that low forecast that we've really been predicting and riding through for the last 140 years. So the East Coasters and really the Midwesterns have kind of been staring like, is it possible? Is it working? Is, you know, what can we learn? And now I think that all of, you know, the utilities within um, our membership group has seen the feasibility. And so I think the key part that you spoke of and you get to drive with your team is empowering the consumer. A, a, creating the message and really paving the way to enable and unlock these technologies to kind of work and coordinate and orchestrate together. So that is Gridbot. So you kind of uh, su su summarized it quite um, nicely. So you kind of answered, you know, we're answering it together, but I think it's always nice to like hear the, the perspective or a question from a different angle. But, you know, as consumers become more involved in their energy usage, uh, and that is happening, and you share some statistics that are quite exciting, but really, you know, from a utility operation perspective, you don't need this huge proliferation to show or see impacts of the engineering, the awareness, the operation, the control, the safety really ha has a new perspective. So um, even though you guys have all these big statistics, the energy usage of a consumer really, you know, how do you see it and how have you seen it affect that traditional utility model? Yeah. So a couple of things here. So we different, as you, you're aware, and I'm sure all your listeners are aware, there's all different types of. We're, we're educating some of them. We like okay. But but also there's a body that are. they're learning so don't assume we know okay well um I also don't want to assume you go no um but it, there's different utility models right like they're they're not all the same across the U S so the the kind that we have in California um is similar to some of the other states we're the couple so that means that 
we're not making money just by the number of kilowatt hours that are flowing through the system. We're making capital investments and getting a rate of return on our capital investments. And why that's important, that was put into place, I think, back in the 70s when energy efficiency became really important so that you know, utilities were still incented to promote energy efficiency, but also build out the grid. So we're in a decouple of utility model. So we've been supporting energy efficiency for decades. Um, we've gotten to the point in California where a lot of the energy efficiency that we do are already built into codes and standards. So the opportunities for utility programs are a little bit less, um, but that's because we've done so much. So it's really, to me, it's energy efficiency is a success story. And so when I think about the utility model, and the numbers that I shared around the num amount of capital investment that we need to do, there is still a huge opportunity for utilities, even when customers are using less energy. That the utility model is strong, the utility is in a great position to help deploy these resources. And I think the shift that's happened that I've seen in the last few years really gets to those um, distribution planners that you were talking about Thank earlier, you. where before, um, I would say maybe there was like skepticism on, you know, how can we use customer demand flexibility? How can we use customer solar vehicle to grid? Whereas now they're like coming and knocking on my door and saying, hey, we have this area that's in the Inland Empire where we have all these warehouses that we're having to build out the grid and we're not going to be able to do it nearly as fast enough as our customers are getting, you know, heavy duty vehicles and delivery trucks electrified. What can you do for demand response here in this area? This is a, it's the shift. Um, and this is a, an important cultural shift because it's going to come down to our distribution planners and engineers changing the way that our standards have been developed to be able to incorporate these resources in a way that we can you know, really count on them, we can forecast, and we can build out our grid in a different way than we did before. And we've seen that we were able to do this on the solar side. We were able to reduce the interconnection time from, you know, months to days. And so I'm confident that we can get there. I think one other piece I put into this, you know, from the customer perspective is how much willingness we have of our customers to be able to respond. Um, and one great example is when 2022, we had 10 days of very hot weather in California. We were on the verge of rotating outages, which we, you know, unfortunately had rotating outages in 2020. And we as a whole state came together. We had been working really closely since 2020, the rotating outages have a playbook between our independent system operator, the hunter's office, the utilities, large consumer groups, um, to be able to be ready if we got into this emergency situation. And we really tested the limits and when we got to, I think it was Labor Day, the day after Labor Day, that was the day we almost had rotating outages. It was the worst of us. 10 days. And side note for wonky, wonky energy people, if you haven't looked at the California Independent System Operator website, they have a great forecast. It's not just day ahead supply and demand, but a week out look ahead where you can see what are the resources on the grid and what is the demand going to be. And it was just looking at like monster waves of energy that was going to be needed. Okay. And the governor's office decided when we got into that really critical day to send out an Amber Alert, which usually is used for missing children, but it goes to all people in California. And they sent out an Amber Alert saying, please conserve energy. And you can look at those at the graphs from that day and the quickness of how customers responded and the amount, it was over a thousand megawatts that were reduced because of that Amber Alert. And that along with, you know, having put more storage onto the system, having larger demand response portfolios, all of these things came together and we were able to avoid rotating outages. So we know that there's opportunity. Do we want to do it through an Amber Alert? No. So what we need to focus on is having the technologies that are um, simple and easy and customers don't have to think about um, so that they're able to provide those benefits to the grid in a way that's not impacting them. I think a really great example is um, heat pump water heaters. So we're really big on heat pumps, both for, you know, space and water heating. And we're doing demonstrations right now, testing different um, water heaters with different profiles. Like, is this a family of four? How long does it take to heat up with this certain heat pump technology? And if they have people come in for vacation and they have six people at the house, how long is it going to take to like deplete the hot water 
so that we can figure out how much demand capability there is, but still keeping the water warm and hot as the customer would want. Um, so we're running tests like that all the time. And that way, as we deploy um, with keep up water heaters, we can use communications to be able to have not just responses when we're having a wholesale grid emergency, like the Kaiso one we had in 2022, but, you know, using it from the distribution system, right? There's just so many great opportunities out there. But again, from the customer side, we know that they have the ability to respond, but we, we really want to do it in a way that they're still getting what they want at their homes, which is the lights on to be cool or, or warm and have, you know, hot water when they want it. So, yeah. so I mean, everything you're saying is, is very exciting for the space of where we need to go and I think provides one hope. So one objective of my podcast and really being the host to this conversation is, you know, there's a lot of conversation that happens at high level and through various information channels that just talk about the problem and the insurmountable hurdles and obstacles. And we don't actually like hear about these awesome uh, solutions or even, you know, even though it happened under a crisis and you used a tool that we don't want to use for the future, what it did show was an outcome, a desired outcome that is achievable by empowering the consumer. It really helps eliminate that story that we've been telling each other for 40 or 50 years that there's no util there's no customer or consumer that would want to have someone else control their energy usage. And I think we as a society have evolved that we have really created a technology that has unlocked many facets of our lives to allow it to monitor, manage, and help support our everyday decisions. So that whole story is being created throughout. And so I guess also when you're talking is a big part of this transformational change is change <clears throat> management. And right, simple terms is like, it's an application of structured process with a set of tools that can lead people. And so you have to achieve a desired outcome. So that emergency, even though it was emergency, <laughs> shows that it's possible with mechanisms that we have today. And we just need to really create that story and drive that conversation and really, you know, tell a friend the positivity of, you know, taking back the realization of the energy we use and making your own personal decisions for the good of others. And I think there's more of that than we actually realize. And so that's, a, that's, that's such a cool example. So thank you for sharing. Can I just pick up on one thing that you said yeah. um, that I found really interesting just this week? We were listening to like testimonials from customers. We were asking them what they wanted to hear from us, particularly around affordability. Um, but, it, you know, these are day-to-day -day folks that aren't, you know, in the energy industry. It was all different walks of life. And most of them said something proactively, which was, we hear that there's electrification coming. We want to hear from the utility on what are your plans and what are like your goals and how are you tracking against those goals to be able to get ready for electrification. And we do a lot of that internally. And so I think there is an opportunity. And I think that was the surprising aha for me that customers, day-to-day -day customers wanted to hear about it too. So there's, yeah, there's a huge opportunity that we have there just for communication. Right. And I think just the shift on realizing you know, that partnership, that cohesion of the utility, it provides a service that consumers are then utilizing. And something that happened over the last hundred years is we've all come to realize it's a lifeline of society. So we actually forget how complicated it is to depend on that switch to go on and go off when you call it to with just a simple um, gadget that we all know and love, which is the light switch. And I guess just even taking us further back, you know, 140 years ago, there was this phenomenon, this idea of lighting up the night mm -hmm. with this fictitious idea of electrical energy. So we've come such a long way. And, and I think using the language around behavioral science, change management, and I think another term I love to bring into the grid mod space is really operational excellence, you know, understanding the people to understand the processes yeah. that need to shift. And we're all a continuous in a space of continuous improvement. So how do we get the message out, share the information and really do this together? So um, I'm actually a little bit jealous of the space that you're working in, getting to connect with the customers on the day to day, hearing right from them, too. So I guess I'll throw another one out. You know, there's a lot of talk, you know, so we now have awareness of technology that can reach each of the individual 
customers, consumers. And then really another part of being a service organization is that you have to serve all. And yeah. during this transformation of adoption of new technologies that can be on-site creations, so the renewable, the green, just new technology, we have to make sure that there is an ability to enable, you know, and create that community development, you know, economic growth and really social equity. And so those are big words that are part of our, you know, fiber in the electric utility space in the last decade and more. But I think now we're talking about it. I'm using that language. You know, how, what are that, those implications that you've seen? This is so important for the transition to make sure we're not leaving anyone behind. So in all, of, I mentioned at the beginning, like all the different types of programs that my team runs and every single one of them, we have a component of making sure that we're serving underserved communities. So a good example is we have transportation electrification programs where we're putting charging stations in all over our service area, whether it's at fleet customers that are electrifying their fleet or at apartments and condos. And we have a goal to get, you know, about 40% of all of those in these underserved communities. And I think that's really important because one, we want to help them adopt electric technologies, but also that means that the people that are driving in their communities are going to be driving cleaner cars. I think another thing that was really huge for us, when we were starting to roll out our transportation electrification programs, we actually talked to stakeholders and communities um, social justice and uh, folks. And we originally had just a very small pilot for passenger vehicles. It's like 1,500 ports. And after doing all of this community engagement, what we found was that the communities were really much more worried about air pollution than GHG reduction. And where that led us from a strategic perspective is to focus on medium and heavy duty vehicles first. Because we have in Southern California, the ports of Long Beach and the ports of Los Angeles that are bringing in 40% of all the goods into the country. And then those trucks are driving into our Inland Empire where there's warehouses for FedEx, Amazon, etc. So we have lots of truck traffic and communities all along those interstates and by the ports are being impacted from a health perspective on you know, a daily basis. So we rolled out a program that we called Charge Ready Transport it was really to electrify the large vehicles that are going on the interstates. And that was back in 2017. So those trucks like weren't even available. We knew that the OEMs were rolling them out. We knew that the California Air Resources Board was putting in fleet regulation. It was going to be coming, but we were able to get that approved through our Public Utilities Commission and, you know, I worked on a lot of different regulatory things, but this was the only time I've seen people going in and saying, please give our utility more money to do this, like, because we need this in our communities. And so we were able to roll that out. You know, been approved, roll it out in 2019. We're seeing a great uptick. You know, the vehicles are there now. Um, and I think that was just a really great example of how a utility can partner with the community, really hear what they want to happen. Um, and then build a stakeholder group to do something and to do it, you know, innovatively, you know, thinking ahead to where we want to be, not just being catching up. So we have examples like that and all the different customer programs that we run, but it's definitely something that's top of mind for us, supporting our customers. Every time you tell a story, it just it, it reminds me, like when we reflect on the change of perspective or really kind of coming to the table and creating that collaborative partnership discussion with the utility is something that I think the utilities have been fighting back for, you know, really the last 40 or 50 years. So if you think about the history, you know, there's the phenomena that they didn't know they needed. Mm -hmm. So the utility folk ultimately got into a space where they were actually selling the gadgets and gizmos that needed electricity, which then created the need, which then created, you know, the growth that we've seen as, you know, society um, by really unlocking the sources of energy that we've, we've created. And, but over time, you know, from a technological perspective, you know, we built the grid in a very robust, reliable, integrated fashion. And there then came a time where we're like, wait, if we go on this continuum, you know, we're not going to have enough grid. So it really got into the space of using less energy. And as you mentioned earlier on our talk, energy efficiency has been shown to be successful, where we really the last 40 years, holistically, our load growth has been plateaued and there was a big concern. And now here we are, the utilities with nobody that's been in the industry really um, for that long. I mean, there's some still those awesome sink tanks of knowledge that are still helping the utilities with their 40 year veteran. 
But now you're going from this plateaued ideology to this exponential growth. And that changes almost every discussion. And yeah. it truthfully changes the trust and the conversation that our consumers, our customers need to realize the grid is here to stay and how do we transform it together for this reality that is coming. And so the fact that you're able to have these very engaged conversations with your community is an indication, I think, that we are moving in the right direction where we're starting to have proactive conversations <laughs> instead of them coming to the, the, the utility way late in their plans. You may, it may not be perfect, but I think there's, you know, maybe a tipping point that's occurring for you all. So that's, yeah, that's great to hear. I'll share another one because it's recent, if you don't mind. I think it was really ex an exciting example of like collaboration with the community. So back in late 2018, 2019, the utilities in California started doing public safety power shutoffs where we turn off power proactively to avoid causing wildfires. Right. And as you can imagine, that was a really big thing for communities. We have customers uh, that are called access and functional needs customers that use power for powering medical devices to keep them alive. Right. And so there was a lot of engagement with uh, these access and functional needs customers to see how we could support them during public safety power shutoffs. And in the early days of having these meetings and collaboratives, it was very contentious. We did not understand each other. Uh, we were speaking a different language. There was lots of frustration, lots of escalation, lots of finger pointing. And fast forward, we had a meeting at, in person a few weeks ago where it was the three and um, I, large IOUs in California. Also, our regulators were on the line and then the key leaders of the access and functional needs community. And we were all like smiling, getting along. We're going to be releasing soon a blueprint of how California has taken care of these customers when we're turning off power, which isn't just relevant to public safety power shutoffs, but like things that happen, unfortunately, in Maui or in Texas. And we have, you know, many utilities reaching out underst to understand how we've been able to help these customers. And a few of the quotes that I loved from that meeting was someone that was more of a, a stakeholder or fly on the wall said, you know, I've seen you all going from like, finger pointing and talking about you to talking about me. And I used to think about the access and functional needs community and the IOUs, but now I just think about the access and functional needs community and the IOUs are just independently owned utilities are just part of that. And so, you know, it took years of really hard work to get there, but I, I think it's just such a great example of how you can go from something contentious where you're on completely opposite sides to like really building something together and being able to share it with other people so that maybe other people don't have to go through all of the same you know, bumps and bruises that we did. Well, I'm very happy you share that story because I think it's going to make a little pep in my step today. You know, there is hope that if we do the hard work and we realize that we're all, you know, beings with connected with the same fiber, you know, you can take that however level you want, that we can come to mutual decisions for the good of all. And I do think it's really rewarding to hear that those contentious conversations can turn into very fruitful um, engagements. And it's what we really need mm -hmm. as we transform, you know, utility space has been for, you know, a century, but really safe, reliable, affordable energy where the new words, which I think words matter a lot. The truth matters a lot of like what you're trying and what your agenda is. But, you know, now we say sustainable, resilient, and I would just like to share, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up our podcast together, you know, how do you um, kind of words of wisdom to, let's say, the utilities that are maybe looking to the West or, you know, looking around the globe to see how you guys have created this continuous positive connection with your customers um, when they're starting those inroads and, and, and creating those conversations. Any uh, words of wisdom or lessons shared just to keep yeah. in mind? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on something you said earlier about, like, lots of conversations talking about the problems. I feel the same. And I wish as an industry, I think with the technologies that we have today, we could probably get 90% of the way. So let's take a beat on arguing about the last 10%. Let's pause that and let's focus on scaling and scaling what we know we need to do. And let's put all of our collective amazing energy into that. And then also, I think talking to the communities, having a hard conversation and really focusing on action and being action oriented is where I would love to be. And then I'd also say like, it's hard. The work is hard. Don't give up. 
be okay with banging our head against the wall for a while because we'll eventually get to um, a good place. And if anyone ever wants to know more about what we're doing in California, please find me on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to have to. Oh, and I guess I'll put a little plug in for AIC. Uh, uh, Southern Cal Edison is going to be hosting an actual workshop that AIC is going to sponsor around large fleet and CNI electrification. So uh, I get to meet you in person, I think, come the fall and really continue this conversation and really provide the advice that's not only happening in Southern Cal Edison, but some other larger utilities that have really championed and really created the path to change. Because it is a big change going, hey, I need um, you need zero megawatts to 50 megawatts overnight. There's a lot of change that has to happen in an organization to make that happen. So my hopes for this podcast is maybe you and I, I Katie, inspire a few uh, early goers to be the champions of change within their utility to not give up. And there is uh, fruitful and hopeful solutions out there. So thanks yeah. again for sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, Elizabeth. This was just a really great conversation and I really appreciate the opportunity. That's a wrap for this week's episode of the GridMod Pod. Thanks for tuning in. We hope today's conversation got you thinking about new and creative ways to improve our power grid. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to hear new episodes. This podcast is brought to you by AEIC, the place where operations leaders come together to share knowledge and provide guidance to the electric utility industry. We'll be back with a new episode soon. Until then, keep powering on.